1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 14. Being a good minister and disciple. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, consistently nourished on the word of faith and on the sound doctrine which you have been following. But have nothing to do with the lordly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. For it is for this that we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself as an example of those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to the exhortation and teaching, and do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through the prophetic utterance by the laying on of hands by the presbytery. You may be seated. Well, we're coming to the second part of being a positive example. And this is in the chapter of cha all of chapter four, really. It, and the overall view of chapter four is church hold fast. We as a church are to hold fast to the truths of God's word. And we saw here in the past, as the church holds fast, what are they to do? First of all, verses one through three of this chapter, we're to be, a, be aware of deception. Secondly, verse four and five is believe and know the truth. Point three is be nourished by the word of faith and doctrine. And point four, be trained in devotion hope and faith, verse seven through 10. And we've come to this section, which we saw the first part of in verse uh, 11 and 12, is in this being uh, holding the church is part of that is to be a positive example. That is how we uphold and hold fast to the church. And we looked last week at by how do we become a positive example by these instructions. <laughs> that was actually verse one through 10. These instructions of that which have come before in verse one through 10. Actually being a positive example throughout this section 11 through 16, there's 10 present tense imperatives. Present tense means it wasn't just for the past, but ongoing. It was then presently, it is now presently an imperative that which is a command, what we're exhorted to do. And we saw the first two of those having to do with by these instructions. Those are the instructions, verse one through 10. Second of all, it's by our conduct. And two, two aspects or imperatives there were both through our actions and through our virtues. Now we come to the third part of being a positive example, our second message on it, is by your calling. And Lord willing, next week we'll look at being a positive example by your perseverance. Kind of gives you an overview of where we've been and where we're going. What do I mean by your calling? Well, the Greek word there for church is ecclesia, which means being called out. That's what literally the Greek word for church is. It's those that are called out. Uh, you can also say an assembly. So there, what is by your calling? Your calling is you're the church. 
If you want to fill in the blank, that's what it is. <laughs> the church. The church isn't a building. It isn't a denomination. It is those who are called by the Lord. And here we have by your calling basically two present imperatives. Two more imperatives in this group of ten in this whole section of being an example. What are the imperatives? One is to give your attention to scripture. And the word used here is for the reading of the scripture is, is public reading. That's what we're here today. The church is to gather together and hear the reading and the public reading and expounding upon the word of God. That, that's why this church is called a Bible church. It's why, whether you like it or not, I feel my calling is, is to give forth the word of God. Not just what I think or what I feel. And that's why I, I can't help myself but just quote more scripture than I, I myself have words to say. Because his word is perfect. And it is powerful. And faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of God, not through hearing me. But what is the church? Yes, it is those who are called out. But there are aspects. There, there are beautiful and demanding aspects of being the church. Those that are believers, those that are called out of this world into his body, into his kingdom. Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, he said, to the church of God, which is in Corinth, and here the church of God, which is in Potosi. To those who have been sanctified, how? In Christ Jesus. That's how we're sanctified. Saints by calling. We aren't saints by doing something to prove our sainthood. We're saints by his calling of us. And he goes on and says, with all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. That's the church. Paul, when he wrote to the Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, he says, and he put all things in subjection under his feet. That is Christ. And gave him as head over all things to the church. All true churches, they're Christ's possession. They're under his feet. We are under his glorious feet. Doesn't that make you want to cry? Doesn't it make you want to wipe his feet with your own hair if it's long enough? Under his beautiful feet. Lovely are the feet of those who bring good news. He's the head over the church. And the, which is his body. Brothers and sisters, you are now physical representations of Christ's own body in this world at this time. That's why it's so important that we are examples of him. And not only which is his body, but in that what it means is it's a fullness of him who fills all in all. He is the one who fills us. Oh, I wish I didn't leak so much. <laughs> There's one baptism, but there needs to be in my own life and in every one of our lives a continual filling. Yeah. To be full of him. 
Is there anything greater to be full of? There is not. And if you've been called by him, you were part of the church, and it means he is filling you. If I just wouldn't put the umbrella over my head. But open to him. That's the church. Saints by calling. Sanctified in him. Filled by him. And here in this, this letter itself, earlier on in 1 Timothy 3.15, what is the church? He says, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church, the church of what? Of the living God. And we as his church, he concludes in that sentence says, the pillar and support of the truth. Every one of us are pillars. Pillars in his temple, his worshipers, those that stand for his truths and his way. The writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 23, says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Don't be a wavering pillar. How can we do that? For he who promised is faithful. Even when we're not. So. Hebrews 10 24 goes on and said, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. That's what we are to consider. That's what we are to think about. That's what we are to meditate on. So that we might apply it. And what we're not to do, verse 5, 25 says, but not forsaking your own assembly together as of the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You were all here. Uh, speaking to the choir, right? But seven days without the Lord makes one week. The question is, what were you saved for? <laughs> Why, why were we saved? Uh, oftentimes we think what we were saved from. I was saved from condemnation and hell and misery and anguish and an eternity being separated from that which is good. That's what we were saved from. But what are we saved for? We are saved to be part, an active part of his body. He, he didn't, give us, didn't give us hands so that we wouldn't use them. We'd throw them to the side or live by themselves, not being attached to the body. It's hard to imagine when the people get saved and they're not attending a church. They're not involved in a church. They're not under the reading and teaching of God's word corporately. What are we, an appendix? You know, even the appendix has a reason. It's there in the body. Well, all of that is an introduction here to verse 413 which is this first exhortation is give attention to scripture. First Timothy 4, 13 says, until I come, give attention to the present imperative, ongoing, the public reading of scripture. 
You might notice that that's in italics, maybe the public and the of scripture, but the Greek word there is that's what it means. Not just, yes, we, we need to be reading the God, word, uh, word of God daily. It, we need to be involved in that. But, but here for the church, we're called together for the reading of God's word to get together. There's something about the corporateness of the body that we we need. There's a special presence of God and there's a present special working of God that is not there solely by ourselves because our function is to serve one another. It says, until I come give attention to the public reading of scripture, ex to exhortation and teaching. We are called to be devoted to this. I can't tell you what, what God may be placing upon your heart and your particular calling. But if you do have a calling, it'll be that which is explicitly and contextually exhorted in God's word, not just from some thing you hear on the radio or something. It may be confirmed by that, but it's only really truly confirmed if it's in the word of God. Uh, for my own calling, I question whether I was really saved just to be a farmer, which I loved. But those were annual seeds. I knew that, that it's only one year after another and they plant it again and it's just that it does help feed people. I love that. I love to see nature and things grow. But I felt through that whole time in my life that the Lord was calling me to feed. He said to feed my sheep. I'm not claiming to be Peter. But there are sheep God's children everywhere. And you do, I've, I mean, I fed livestock. I raised cattle. I fed hogs. I had sheep for a while. It is so much, was so much more to be able to feed God's people the word of God than to feed hay and grain and that to livestock. Not that it isn't important. I'm not... But you have to know it's your calling. And here, what is the scripture to do? It is for encouragement. Parakletus is a Greek word. What's the significance of that? Well, its literal meaning is to be called alongside. It's very similar to the work of the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. We are called to be, we are called, be called alongside one another. None of us are to be islands, independents. It means exhortation sounds maybe, at times maybe it may be a harsh correction, but primarily it means encouragement to come alongside one another to help one another. And the, re the scripture is there as a tool, as an avenue, as a means to encourage and exhort one another and ourselves. And we're called to be placed under that. Paul wrote, writing to the Romans, Romans 15, four, he says, for whatever is written in earlier times are written for our instruction so that through perseverance, the encouragement of the scriptures might do what? Might, they might have hope. So that through the perseverance and the encouragement of scripture, we might have hope. I mean, maybe you don't need hope. I mean, 
then you maybe feel like you're on top of the world and that hope, oh, no, I don't need any hope in this world. I've got, you know, I've got the world by the ropes. <laughs> if you're like me, you feel more like the world has you tied. The scripture is what gives us encouragement. God's promises and his direction and coming alongside of us. And it's also for the teaching of truth. It's the same word there as doctrine. Teaching doctrine, teaching truth, teaching instruction. It's all the same. I was never so shocked. One of the things that that pushed me, you know, wooed and pushed me into ministry was I was working as an associate pastor under a uh, pastor that graduated uh, have from um, uh, a seminary in near Chicago. And uh, he made this statement and he made it more than once. He says he doesn't teach doctrine. And I, I just, what do you mean? He, he, he was preaching every Sunday, most of it was psychologically oriented and he had great stories and, and people really liked to hear him and he was great at reading music and all, doing all that stuff. But he said, uh, you see, doctrine divides. So I don't teach doctrine. Well, teaching is doctrine. And he was teaching. He just wasn't teaching the word of God. At least not straightforward. And he, and he had a lot of doctrine that wasn't in line with scripture as well. But we are to be taught by the word of God. It is our doctrine. It, it doesn't come from a pope. It doesn't come from a uh, denomination. It comes from Christ's own words and his apostles and from his word. That is true teaching. Paul, later on in this book, 1 Timothy 6, 3 says, if anyone advocates a different doctrine or teaching and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions. And constant fiction, but friction between men of deprived minds and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness actually is a mean of great gains when accompanied by contentment. It's not by being accompanied by pride and anger. No. It's by being accompanied by godliness. As I mentioned here a week or two ago, you know, we are now in the Lenten season. And if you decide to do something during this season as we approach Easter, what was a good thing to do? Are what you committing yourself to, is it to be, is it to godliness? Something that makes you more godly? I don't know that just eating fish makes you more godly. <laughs> the words of Christ applied in our lives by our conduct and our virtues and our lives and our actions they should be that which is more Christ-like. And it's always better to be committed to that. Whether it's the Lenten season or not. But especially as we approach the divine celebration of our risen Lord. Well, the second part here is what we are not to do. That's the things we are to do, exhortation and teaching, be grounded, be applying. The second imperative is do not neglect your spiritual gift. First Timothy 4, 
14 says, do not neglect, again, this in present imperative, doesn't mean just once, but always, continually, do not neglect your spiritual gift, which within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterances and the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Now, again, he's talking specifically here to Timothy. And what is this laying on of hands of the presbytery or elders? In other words, they had recognized or confirmed that Timothy had the gift of teaching and preaching. See, there's, there is, there should be a coordination. We're, we're not to be just lone rangers in the church and decide, well, I'm going to do this on my own. They should be that which is affirmed by the, by the leaders within the congregation, within the, within the church. And it was for Timothy and it should be for us. But all of us have a spiritual gift. That's what God's word says. That's what was given to us when the Holy Spirit entered us at the time of salvation, when we were born again. And it's a work that the Holy Spirit desires to do within each of us as individuals. It says, do not neglect. In other words, not care for. We're supposed to care about the spiritual gift. We, not, we shouldn't be careless about it. Like, well, I, I care less whether I have a spiritual gift or I'm using it or not. Or I'm just, not, I'm not going to pay attention to it. Or I'm just going to neglect it. Because it's a gift not given to you, each one of us as individuals, but not for ourselves. It is given to us to serve others. The same Greek word there, do not neglect, is translated, pay no, or they pay no attention to, in a parable that Jesus gave, the parable of the wedding banquet. The parable of the wedding banquet in Matthew 22, 5 says, but they paid no attention or they neglected and went their own way, one to his own farm and the others to his business. It's getting so caught up in the other things in this world, whether it's your farm or your business or whatever, that you decide I'm not going to pay any attention to that which the Lord has given me to do for others within the church and for his kingdom and his name. It's like those that the Lord called on in the parable uh, to tell them what you've done with the talent that he's given you. We don't want to be the one who buries the talent. That he's given us to invest. He's not given us so that, well, I've kept it my whole life. I haven't, haven't, hasn't got used up. Well, what are these gifts for? Well, first of all, they're for every member, every part of the body. Romans 12, 4 through 6 says, For just as we have many members in one, in one body, all the members do not have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ. And individual members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to, is to exercise them accordingly. Mm -hmm. You're to exercise the gift. You know, as he'd earlier said, you know, physical exercises of some worth, but spiritual exercise is of worth in this life and the life to come. It is given for every member. It's also given for the building up of the body. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 says, And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. All of that just so that they would have that role? No. 
for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. The teacher or pastor is only to equip you. You're to use it. I am too, but in that role, you, every part of the body is to use it. And what for? For the building up of the body of Christ. And how long? Until we all obtain the unity of faith and for the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. <laughs> so you, are we going to get done with that right away? No. Not, we won't be done with his maturing us. And we won't be done using the gifts he's given us until we go to heaven and we're no longer needed here. It's for the building up of the body. It's for every member and it's also for caring for one another. First Corinthians 12, 24 Kind of the, the second part of verse 24. He says, but God has so composed the body, giving some, giving more abundant honor to members which lacked. So that there might be no divisions in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. A sign of there being divisions and while we're sure in a time in history where there is great divisions within many of the churches of God. Are people really using the spiritual gifts that they're given? If they are, that should be what brings unity. <laughs> Not disunity, not divisions, not anarchy. It's caring for one another. And the final in this little overview of application here is point four for serving one another. Not only caring, but serving. First Peter 4.10 says, as each one has received a special gift. It's each one of us. Each one of us who are in Christ. Each one who is a believer is part of the church. And it's each one has received a special gift. Employ it in serving one another as a good steward of the manifold grace of God. You know, there's, there's various ways in which God's grace works. Unmerited favor. Manifold. Uh, if you were, if you were an old timer working on VH, you know that a manifold has divided, all these exhausts come together into one. There's many cylinders. It, uh, if you ever had variegated steel, you know, how it has all these or how the rainbow is made up of a combination of all the colors. It's the same Greek word there, man, translated manifold. <clears throat> there are many colors to the, to the stream and colors of grace, but they all come, true grace comes from God. And they're to be applied in, in, various ways of as we are to be stewards of that grace that's been given us so that we might share grace with one another in serving one another this is a man mandate of the church lord willing next week we'll look at persevering with this and uh, let us let us go to prayer